Well, if you want to follow along with me, we'll be in the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 15. Um, and then partway through, we're going to jump over to Romans chapter 4. So if you want to be prepared to be able to jump over there as well. Uh, we're going to continue on, on as we look at this ultimate promise that we've been given as we prepare our hearts for the Christmas season and the time of, of Christ's birth. And we looked at uh, last week the, the very beginning of that promise that a Savior was going to be coming, but that was about all the details that was given. And so now we're going to look at a little bit more of the information that was given to Abraham of this idea that he... Um, was going to be fully convinced in what his faith was going to be in regards to the part of this promise that is the ultimate one that was to come. So Genesis chapter 15, we're going to start in the first verse. Before we read that, though, I want to remind us of the, the context. Before this, it was declared to us that Abraham was a very wealthy man. That the Lord had been blessing him much, and there was this... Uh, war between these kings off to the east and these kings that were in the, the area of Canaan and they, they came and they attacked the area and they uh, took captive all these people and Abraham's nephew Lot was taken with them. And so Abraham takes his 318 men and he goes and he rescues his nephew Lot and the other people of the land and, and brings them back and that's where we meet Melchizedek and Abraham gives them a tenth of the spoil there. And but then the king of Sodom tells Abraham, take whatever you want from the spoils of war. And Abraham tells him, no, he goes, I have lifted my hand up to God, which is a sign of a covenant to make an agreement with God and say that only God would be the one that would be where he would get his resources from. And he said, told the king of Sodom, he goes, I don't want it to be that anybody would say that you have made me rich, but God has. And so that is the, the background of what is happening. And so now we get into the context of chapter 15. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. So he starts off here, and the first thing that he says is, Fear not, Abraham, I am. God is making him be the focus of what is going on with the context of what God is going to say there. And a great application for us is to remember that, is when we make ourselves the focus, that's when life can become very confusing and nerve-wracking for us of our anxiety because we have to handle everything that is coming our way. But when we change it up, when we make God the focus, that He is our provider, our shield, that is when we can help get our, get our encouragement into our life, realizing we're not the manufacturers of the things that we need to do. We're just distributors. We're just taking what God has given us, and we're just going out and doing the work. We don't have to produce the work, and all that burden is relieved off of our shoulders. God says, fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. A shield can be figurative or metaphorical to speak of protection, but it also can speak of glory. And I really think that's the, the context that God is using here with shield. It's not a protection that he's talking about, but glory. And we find that in Psalms 3.3 or Ezekiel 27 verses 10 and 11, where the shield is in reference to glory. And so really what God is declaring, he says, Fear not, Abraham, I am your glory. Your reward shall be very great. He's encouraging Abraham that what his resources are, are founded in him. It goes on in verse 2, But Abraham said, O Lord Yahweh, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Now it sounds kind of harsh here as we reread it in this context going, wow, Abraham seems to kind of be complaining to God of what is going on. And it's not necessarily what is, is going on. Really what Abraham is kind of communicating to God is going, God, what good is a reward going to do me because I have nobody to hand it down to? It's basically what he's saying. It's just a member of my household. And what he means by that is not a direct lineage to him, but just somebody that is in his, his band, that is a part of, you know, his servants were considered part of the household and stuff like that. So he's saying, I have no physical heir to give anything to. It's just going to be somebody else. What good is this going to, to do me, Lord, to be rewarded? 
because I have nobody to pass it on to that is in my family, is what he's telling to God. So God responds to him in verse 4. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look towards heaven. and Number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So God answers Abraham's question. And it's a great reminder to us that God is concerned about our pondering. And we've talked about this before. There's questions that are just asked in order to try to attack something. And God doesn't like those kind of questions when we're questioning his, who he is or what he's doing. And we see that in the book of Job where he has to kind of set Job straight going, hey, you know, were you here when I laid the foundations of the earth? Like, you weren't here. Careful about questioning my, my ways. But there, God does allow our questioning when it's the aching of the heart or it's an inquisitive mind where we're trying to ponder things out. And this is where Abraham's at, going, God, I don't get this. How is this reward going to be of any value? I am not have anybody to hand it down to. And God deals with him where he's at to answer his questions, to give him the assurance that he needs. And he will do that for you and I as well. And we're reminded this even in the New Testament. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, we read, Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We don't want to forget that God cares for us, and we see an aspect of his caring in this text here, where he is willing to talk to Abraham, and then he gives them the analogy of the stars. At first, uh, and up until this time, Abraham just had the dust of the earth being unnumberable, and God saying, this is like your descendants, and now he has used the glory of the stars to say, just as, as numerous as those are, it would be so hard to try to number those, even with what we can see with the naked eye, so it's going to be like your descendants. It's going to be hard to contact him. So whether Abraham's looking down at the ground or he's looking up in the sky, he's reminded of the promise that God has given him. He says, that's what your offspring's going to be. And again, the literal translation of that would be seed, that same word that we would have read in Genesis 3.15 about that promise of a seed that was to come. We go on then in verse 6. And he believed Yahweh, and he accounted it to him as righteousness. So Abraham took what God said, and he trusted what he had to say. And so God says, therefore, he counted it to him as though he was righteous. So an example maybe of this is uh, Corbin has to be in children's church, so we're going to use this little dude to represent Corbin, okay? This, uh, what is this guy again? Uh, swims in the river. Otter, thank you. All right. <clears throat> So this is a, so we're going to pretend here, because I didn't get an illustration here, we're going to pretend there's a chasm off to my right here, all right? And we have to jump this chasm to get to the other side. And I tell Corbin that, all right, we have to jump over that. And Corbin says, Dad, I'm too small, I can't jump that. And I look at it, and, oh, he's right, we, he can't jump that. So I say, okay, Corbin, hold on to me, and we're going to jump this together. And so we <laughs> jump it over, all right? It's as counted as... Corbin has jumped that chasm because he is now on the other side. He was incapable of doing it himself. But what counted to him as though he jumped it? He trusted his dad, right? He was willing to hold on and say, okay, dad, I trust you that you're going to be able to make that jump. And so that's kind of what God is talking about with our faith counting to us as righteousness. God's saying, you can't do this. But if you trust me that I can do it for you and you hold on to me, and it's going to be accounted as though you did it because you're with me the entire time. And that's what he's saying with Abraham, with him trusting God is accounted to him as righteousness. So what is this righteousness? Righteousness is this idea of doing what God has asked us to do. That's why trust can bring us into this relationship. So if we take this complete thought of kind of what we've read at the beginning of Genesis chapter 15, it's as though as God is saying to Abraham, I am your righteousness, what we read in verse 1 with the shield. I am your righteousness. By trusting in me, you have accepted it. All right? And that's what we're going to find in Romans of how this applies to us as well. By trusting him, it's as though we have taken a hold of God who is our righteousness. It's that breastplate. Remember, we're supposed to put on the breastplate of righteousness, but we aren't righteous. And so it's really God's armor that we're putting on to ourselves. So we put on Christ's righteousness to protect us. But then there's a responsibility now that we have that armor on, right? We weren't 
uh, armor isn't there to be put on just to lounge around on a sofa, right? You don't do that. You put on armor because you have a task to go and to do. And so it's the same with Christ's righteousness. We put that on, but then we try to emulate being good of what he called us to do. And one of the things is to go out and do his work, and that armor then protects us from the attacks, the schemes of the enemy. So we need to remember when this faith is counted as righteousness, we're talking about salvation righteousness here, not about our everyday walk, saying, well, now that I believe in Christ, I don't have to worry about doing good or bad things because my faith has made me righteous. All right, there's, a separate, there's a separation between saving faith and then that faith that we live out because we're saved. All right? And so I want to give an analogy of this. Say that you were in a boat, you fell out of the boat, and now you are floating into the water. All right? Your fear is from sinking down into the water, which is going to lead to drowning. So somebody on that boat takes a life preserver and they toss it out to you and you put it on. All right? So now you have buoyancy with this life preserver. The life preserver has prevented you from sinking, but you're still out into the water. So you have a responsibility as the people are yelling from the boat, we can't get to you, you need to swim to us. Watch out for those sharp rocks over there, and when you get to us, you need to climb up the ladder. All right? That's kind of the, how saving faith works. The saving faith is like getting the life preserver that's giving you buoyancy. Saving faith keeps you from being separated from God for eternity, just as the life preserver keeps you from sinking down into the water. But now that you have the life preserver, you have a responsibility to do something with that and to follow the instructions on how to move forward. Just as our saving faith, we're saved, now we need to be doing something now that we're saved with that. Because you sitting out in the water, bobbing up and down with your life preserver, yes, it's going to sustain your life, but is there really much value to your life then? If you're just bobbing out in the water forever going, well, I have my life preserver now. I don't have to worry about doing these other things that these people are asking me to do. I'll just bob the rest of my life out here in this ocean. And that's kind of what it's like for you and I if we have saving faith that we're righteous because we believe, but then we're stopped there. I don't really care about what the Bible tells me, what I'm supposed to be doing and things that I should be refraining from. That doesn't matter because I'm saved. Well, then it's just as though we're bobbing out there in the water and our life just kind of becomes meaningless. Yes, we're saved. We get to go to heaven. But you spent your whole life doing nothing. So we want to be a part. So there's still a response that we have given the fact that we have this saving faith. So how does this all deal with you and I? This is a great historical lesson. We learned a little bit about Abraham, but what does this do for you and I in our, our daily walk? How does it apply to us? Well, Instead of me saying it, I think Paul does it the best in Romans. So if you want to flip with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and we're going to jump down to verse 13. Romans 4.13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So Paul reminds us here that the promise came before this law ever did. Abraham is in the lineage before Moses, before Egypt and the ten plagues that we read about and them leaving Egypt to go into the wilderness and to get the law. Abraham's before all that. So Paul reminds us that this promise is first, and Galatians goes in more detail to talk about, okay, if the promise was given first, then what comes after the promise can't annul what was given before it. It can fulfill, and we see that with Christ. He fulfills things that have come before it, but he doesn't override it and say that doesn't matter anymore. He fulfills things, but he doesn't say it doesn't matter. So the promise, since it came first, the law couldn't overpower it or be something brand new is what... Paul is saying there in 13. Verse 14. For if the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, or sorry, let me reread that. Verse 14. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. What he's basically saying there is the promise of righteousness by faith is meaningless if we can earn righteousness. All right? If that makes sense, it would be as though if I was to tell my kids, all right, kids, or, or you guys, if you be 
if you're really good, and if you guys pay really good attention right now, then I'm going to give you the gift of air. Doesn't that motivate you to be able to do that? My gift is pretty much meaningless because you have access to it already. That's what Paul is saying about righteousness. If we can by our good works do the things that God has asked us to be and say, I'm going to be a good enough person, then what was the point of the promise? Is be just as foolish as me telling you guys, I'll give you air if you do a great job. I can get that on my own. So Paul's trying to remind us of that, of going, if we can do this onto our own, then it makes no sense that God has given us a promise to be able to give us something that we can, can do. He says, for the law brings wrath in verse 15, but where there is no law, there's no transgression. And he's not trying to say that the whole point of the law was to come so God could judge us and put his hand down and discipline us. It's the whole concept of how the law works. So with the law, the law warns us of sin. This is what it looks like to do things against God or to do the things that God asks us to do. Without having this, these rules, we wouldn't know that they exist. So the law warns us, this is what the relationship basically looks like with God. Here's the standards you need to have, and here's the things you need to refrain from. The problem is, is that we still have this will to sin or rebel. And we've seen that in the Garden of Eden, how we learned the difference between good and evil, and now we kind of have that know-how how to do evil things, and in a way we kind of start desiring to do that. And we don't always have the willpower to not sin against him. So that's a problem with our flesh. And therefore, because God is a God of just or a God of justice, he must punish sin or rebellion against him. So therefore, we know his standards, we can't keep them, so therefore he must punish us. That's why he's saying the law brings forth wrath. It's not his purpose, it's just the ultimate concept of what the law ends up bringing because of our depravity of our not being able to keep his standards. So where there is no law, there's no transgression, is what he's saying. I should have just left it up there. I spent all that time trying to flip through. So what he's saying, and where there's no law, there's no transgression. Oh, what do you know? It's the verse I was trying to look up to read. So what he's meaning there is this is what, it's the law that gives us the awareness of sin. We don't know the rules unless they are shared to us. All right? So uh, a way I think can kind of somewhat illustrate this is a concept that maybe some of us will know this because we've studied it, but there was a time in our life where we didn't know this, okay? And so you need to go to the point in your life where you didn't know this. But inside our bodies, we have a natural chemical uh, to stimulate our central nervous system called phenethylamine. All right, we're going to call it PEA for short because I don't want to have to keep pronouncing that word wrong. All right, so PE we have into our bodies that stimulates our central nervous system. In our brain, what it does is it throws this natural stimulant into our bloodstream. And it's what gives us that butterfly kind of feeling and that excitement that we get when we are with somebody that we are really fond of, all right, and uh, have strong feelings about. And it's the term we would use of when we feel we're in love. We've got those butterflies, we're energetic, we're excited to be around them. It's from this chemical going into our bodies. Now, whether we knew that or not, it was always going on, right? But it's that knowledge of that chemical can, that can really help us out. Because over time, though, our bodies are uniquely designed by God that we are able to not always be overstimulated, right? If we walk into a room that has a really strong odor to it, we notice it right away. But after we've been in there a while, we don't really notice that odor anymore. And it's our body's way, or God's design into our bodies, so we're not overstimulated going, okay, I'm used to that smell. I don't have to keep reminding the brain that that smell's in existence, so we're going to kind of tone that down. It's the same thing the body does with this PEA that's in our bloodstream. It learns to tolerate it and go, okay, this is kind of a normal occurrence when we're around this individual, so I'm, we're not going to feel this way anymore. All right, so it's not, when we don't have those feelings anymore, it's not that we've fallen out of love with them. We've just learned to tolerate them. Right? <laughs> now, our body has just learned that, okay, this is a natural thing that happens when we're around this. I don't have to overstimulate the body. So just as the law, how knowledge of the law can help us understand what a relationship with God is, understanding that mechanism of how that PEA works into our bodies helps us to understand what's going on with these feelings that we have. 
And it totally changes the relationship, right? Once you know the law, you're able to have a relationship with God because you know who he is. With us, it helps us with PEA to understand that with relationships because now we realize when I don't feel those butterflies anymore, it has nothing to do with the love that I have for them. It's just a chemical reaction that's going on. And really, it's kind of a high. It's an amphetamine that's going on inside our bodies. And so when we don't realize that and we don't have those feelings anymore and so we break up with that person and go, oh, I don't love them anymore. And then we find the next person and we get those feelings again. We have that and then we just jump from relationship to relationship because we have a misunderstanding of what's going on inside our, our body. All right? And so it's that same thing with the law. That it's, there's, it's, still, it's all going on there. The law was still there for even those who didn't understand it. And it's not that when you don't know the law that you can't break the law. It's just that knowledge of the law changes the relationship totally. And that's why God had to give it to us. Just like it's important for us to know about those chemicals so we don't jump from relationship to relationship, misunderstanding that high that we're feeling with the phenamine that's going on into our body. It has nothing to do with love. It's just a chemical reaction of what's going on. So we go on then to read in verse 15. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the inheritance of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. It depends on faith, not the law as we just looked at it. Again, it's, it's that analogy of the jump. It's the trust. It's the holding on that it depends on. And he goes on to remind us that Abraham isn't just the father of the natural descendants that came from his loins, but all of us who believe because he was the first one that the promise was given to, that those of us that trust in God as well were brought in as part of the family as well. So it's not just Abraham's the father of many nations because he had Ishmael and Isaac, but also because of all of us that are Gentiles, that are outside of the Israel family, that are brought in by faith. We're accounted as Abraham's offspring as well. Then verse 18. In hope, he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So, Abraham believed in hope against hope. It's contrasting the two types of hope we can have in the world. The, the hope that Abraham had, which was the expectations based on the promises of God, and he was able to overcome this other hope. And the other hope is the hope that we get just based off of our own reality and the circumstances that we see all around us. So let's start with that hope, that hope that we just get from the world or who we are. The problem is, is our assumed expectations, that hope that we have, the expectations that we have, are changed because of the negative circumstances that we find ourselves in. And so, since we have negative circumstances, our expected expectations that are going to happen because of those negative circumstances end up resulting in our uncertainty that anything can ever happen good in this situation. That's the problem with normal hope. But Abraham had a hope against this hope. And so what it's basically saying is the antidote for that then is an expectation based on the promise of God. And that's what helped Abraham out. His expectation, his hope, this expectation based on the promise beat out those experiences or that expectation based on circumstances he had of that his body and Sarah's body was really old. That would seem that, okay, this is impossible given human anatomy. But he was able to conquer that based on the promise of God. And it helped 
even in his uncertainty on his wavering concerning the promise of God. He was able to stand firm going, no, I'm not going to waver. I'm not going to be uncertain about what God has promised because his hope is greater than the other one. And that is the same for you and I. Now, that's a hard thing to always come to. Not all of us have that great gift of, of having um, faith and trust in God, and it can be a little bit more of a battle. And so that last part of that verse is so important for all of us, but especially if you struggle with faith, where it tells us that Abraham, he grew strong in his faith, faith as he gave glory to God. You want to strengthen up your faith and your trust in God's promises, then you have to gl glory or give glory to God, which is remembering who he is, talking through in the God is, that he's all-powerful, that he's all-present. Contemplating those things and praying about those things are going to strengthen your faith because the more you remember about who your God is that you serve, the easier it's going to be to get through the hard times into life because you remember who's on the other side. I am weak, but wait, he is strong. And so that's going to strengthen your faith and the promises that God has given you instead of being like, eh, I don't really know if God can do this. We'll be fully convinced as we read there, in this passage, that God was able to do what he has promised. And that's the point that we want to get to as well, where we take the promises God has given us and say, I am fully convinced that this is going to happen. Think of this as our confidence that we have, our jar, and these little puff balls are our assurance. It's not to the point where we have just a little bit, and we're sitting there going, eh, it's a possibility that this could happen. It's not that we're... Uh, we're over kind of the halfway mark, and it's, well, it's, it's possible. It's a probability that this is going to happen. No, it's fully assured. Our confidence is full of assurance to the point where we say, I know this is going to happen because God has promised it to me. And this is the point that we all want to strive to be because otherwise we're going to be so confused and worried as we go out through this life. He goes on then to say in verse 22, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. It's because of these facts that we're given, that it's counted as, as righteousness, being fully assured. It's that hope that goes beyond any expectations that we have or uncertainties that we might have. And we want to remember that God has never asked us to be perfect. He's just only asking you to trust him. All right? And we see that with the disciples. They were not perfect by any means, but they were faithful. They trusted him and they followed along with him. And that is all God is asking of you and I. So when we fall short, we don't have to feel bad. It's just we need to stay faithful to him. We need to trust him. So it's when we trust him that we're relying on God. And therefore, when we've relied on God, we've just done what he's asked us to do. Therefore, it equals righteousness, doing what God has asked us to do. Do you get the, the connection? God says, rely on me for salvation and the other things that you need. And we say, okay, I trust in you on that. I'm going to rely on you. Oh, wait, I just did exactly what he asked me to do. I'm doing the right things, righteousness. And so it's counted to us as righteousness. Verse 23, but the words it is counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for the trespasses and raised for our justification. So that fact that Abraham was, it was, his faith was counted as righteousness was not just a thing of a narrative to tell us about Abraham's walk, but Paul reminds us that promises for you and I as well. And that's what makes this account so important. Again, it's like the jump analogy of us holding on to God to do what we are not capable of doing. And we're believing in him who raised Jesus from the Lord that he was delivered for our trespasses, means that he died for our sins, our shortcomings, our rebellion against God, and he was raised for our justification so we can have a relationship back with God forever. And then the first two verses of chapter 5 are a great summary statement of what we just read there. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, so we're looked at as though we have done nothing wrong, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We have peace, a relationship again with our Heavenly Father through the work that Jesus Christ has done for us. Verse 2, Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So because of the work of Christ, we now found grace, favor of the Lord. And that's where we stand now when we trust in the work of the Lord. It's not something future, but it's where we're at right now. We are adopted sons and daughters of Christ. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And this is what gives us great joy and to be joyous in this hope, this expectation we have because of the glory of God. Who God is. That He is an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God. That glory. Remember, that glory is what strengthens our faith. And that is where our great joy comes into. And so part of this ultimate promise that we have is that we don't have to try to do it all on our own. And it was first shown through Abraham. Yes, I'm going to have rules and regulations so you know what it's like to follow me and have a relationship with me. But that's not ultimately how you get to me. That's what we do after we have the life preserver on. We do those things because we are saved. The saving comes just from trusting him. God has done what we are incapable of doing. And what a great part of the promise that was added during the time of Abraham.